it gets a lot more invitations than I do. Um, I, I, I'm sort of along to, to carry it, um, but um, it, it's gone to a lot of places uh, around the country over the years for different events and whatnot. And so it's always a very popular thing for people to see. Um, Crockett is such a uh, such an icon of American culture, and it, he covers so many generations that things that are authentic, that are related to him, are rare because he was just a poor guy on the frontier uh, until he died at the Alamo. And so you don't have a lot of uh, Crockett items that you're sure belong to Crockett. Uh, we're fortunate in this particular gun uh, to know right where it was and the chain of where it went from when Crockett got it and when he, when he tra traded or left it, when he left East Tennessee. And so we've got a, um, a really interesting, um, easy to understand, simple transition of the rocket, of the rifle from, from Crockett on through to, to me eventually. Only maybe two others. Um, there's one that was a ceremonial rifle that the Whigs of Philadelphia gave to Crockett when he was running for president back in 1832, I think. No, it was earlier than that. But anyway, the, the, the Whigs of, of Philadelphia gave Crockett a rifle that was engraved to him, and that rifle has stayed in the Crockett family ever since that time. But he never really used that rifle. It was just one that he got and then just handed off, and it wasn't a, wasn't a rifle that he actually used. This one and that one are the only two I know of that are uh, documented Crockett rifles that he owned and, uh, and had. Uh, th those are the only two I'm aware of. Crockett owned a lot of rifles in his lifetime. This was obviously one of his early rifles, probably not his first one, um, but in the very early part of his uh, growing up, getting married uh, during that period and his, his East Tennessee period. He definitely left it in East Tennessee when he moved to West, to Middle Tennessee. And so we do know uh, the time that he left the gun here. We're not exactly sure of the time when he acquired the gun. The rifle went from Crockett to my great, great, great grandfather, James McQuestion, who lived on Long Creek in Jefferson County. And that the site of where he lived and where Crockett lived is only about a mile from the intersection of Interstates 81 and 40. So if you want to know the basic area of where this came from, if you went, if you were coming from Asheville, North Carolina on Interstate 40, <clears throat> when you come to where the the road, the highway makes the turn toward Knoxville at 81. If you went straight ahead in about a mile, you'd be in the middle of where Crockett lived and where my ancestors lived and where this gun came from. Uh, the, the Long Creek community was just a little place out nearest town was Dandridge, uh, and it was some 10 miles away. Um, and Polly Finley's family lived in this area and um, Crockett uh, was, was courting Polly Finley, of course, and that was one of the things that drew him to, to that particular part of the world. And he was living at the time with a Quaker, by the name of John Canaday, uh, who lived up toward Morristown, uh, and uh, who was very helpful to Crockett at this period in his life. And a lot of the things I think that made Crockett Crockett had to do with his life with the Quakers for the some three to four years that he lived with them. Different times when he carried his gun. Uh, he said, I took my gun and went so and so and, and, um, and the way I remember it, he took it when he fir went to first meet Polly Finley. Um, and I, I still can't be sure, he talks about his gun and he had several guns and it's hard to pin down exactly which one he would have been carrying at that time. But um, th this, this was during that period that he had this gun.
Well, when I was a little boy and the Crockett craze came along, uh, my dad related the story. We were in Dandridge at my grandmother's house, and my dad related the story that up on Long Creek, as he said, uh, his, his ancestors lived and Crockett lived in the same place. And when he got ready to leave uh, East Tennessee to go west, that he traded, he owed a, a debt to my ancestor who ran a little country store in the neighborhood and that he gave the rifle as part of what he owed him uh, before he left for, for Middle Tennessee, uh, Winchester area and um, that it stayed in the family the whole time. Uh, my, my uncle, it went from um, James McQuestion, who was the man who Crockett knew and lived there in the area, it, to his son, Sam McQuestion. Sam McQuestion owned the house that my father grew up in. And when he died in 1893, he did not leave a will. And so the rifle was not, uh, there were no directions on how to dispose of it. And eventually it went to uh, Sam McQuestion, who was the only male heir in that line of the family. And so he took the gun and went to Oklahoma for a lot of years and then on to California. It was in a museum in Oklahoma uh, for quite a few years in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then it eventually went out to him in California. He died, it went to his grandson. Uh, his grandson, uh, I, I contacted his grandson in 1978 and said, I'd like to buy the rifle and made him an offer. And he said, yeah, I'll sell it to you. And so 24 hours later, I was on his doorstep in, Cal in San Diego, California with m cash and a book <laughs> and, uh, and got the rifle. And it was, it was in bad shape. The, the part of the stock from here up was missing, this, this wood part right here. This was later put back like it was supposed to be. Um, the, it was broken in here, so the, the, this, this was separated from this. Um, and it was in pretty bad shape. It just sort of, sort of banged around, I guess, over the years. But I got a real good, uh, a couple of real good restoration guys that worked on this over the years and gotten it to, to be in really good shape. It, it, it obviously is very old and sort of brittle and been broken in a lot of places, so it's like, it's like me, you can't handle it too rough or it's not gonna do good, but um, it, um, it looks amazing. I mean, it, it is, everything's original except for this piece right under here. The nose cap's original, the ferrules are original. Uh, the lock is not, hardly any of them had the same locks. They wore those out pretty fast. Uh, but all the brass work is the same. Um, so it, it's essentially the gun he had, uh, minus the things we did to, to get it fixed over the years. Um, and and, and it, it is, a, the people who have looked at it, who are Kentucky rifle experts, say this is a very nice Kentucky rifle. I mean, as, as the Kentucky rifle go, Kentucky rifles go, it's a great example of a Pennsylvania made Kentucky rifle that, that people would have carried into this area. I, I think every little kid my age at five or six years old uh, in 1956 when, when Disney put Crockett on the, on the air uh, became instantly enamored of Crockett. There was a, before that it was cowboys, but when Crockett came along it was a big deal. I mean, and then Fess Parker came to Knoxville and he stood in the, I think it was the basement of the old Riches building and became Miller's, it was Miller's and Riches alternately, but Anyway, my mom took me to meet him and we stood in a long line and walked under this. I remember you could look up and see the grates on the sidewalk. We were under the street and this long line snaking its way into the, where he was. And um, Fess Parker was standing there holding his rifle and here's little six-year-old me and a thousand other six-year-old kids just like me. Uh, you got to shake his hand and see, the, see him holding this gun. Guns were for people my age were, were just something real special. Uh, it, any kind of gun, a pistol, a rifle, a shotgun, anything. And so to have a rifle like this was really impressive. So he had one 
very much like this one right here. He was standing beside him holding me. And I got to shake his hand, and, uh, and it, it was a big deal. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that. I'd love to have had a, had a picture of that, but we didn't get that. No, I do not. Um, it was, um, I couldn't even venture to guess when it, my guess is it's not been fired, golly, since it was in East Tennessee. I, I doubt that Sam McQuestion, when he left, ever fired this gun. In fact, I'm sure he didn't. Um, and pr prior to that, it just sat in a closet in my grandmother's old house that, that, uh, where, where the fella her uncle uh, had it uh, for years, and he was not a hunter or a guy who fired shotguns. So I, it would go back to um, perhaps even the time that when Crockett, Crockett could have been the last guy that fired this gun. Um, this is a flintlock rifle. And the flint is in the hammer right here. You cock it back. You can see this piece of rock sticking out of the um, little vise that holds it right here. This, this screw tightens down on that. And it's got a little piece of leather that cushions it. And this is called the frizzen. And that's what, this is a real hardened steel piece that when this rock hits that hardened steel, it makes a spark. And so this is the pan and the pan is where you pour the gunpowder. And if you look in through the pan, there's a little tiny hole called the touch hole that runs into the back of the barrel. And that's where the powder is, is packed so that when you close the frizzing, it holds the powder in, doesn't let it fall out. But when you cock the gun back and this flint hits this, it pushes that back, sparks fly into the pan, fly into the powder inside the gun, and hopefully it fires. Uh, a lot of times they didn't fire. The powder got wet or something happened to the pan up here, it didn't, but most of the time they did. Um, brass was the thing that was used on the early guns. Uh, they became Crockett later in talking about rifles he preferred, preferred just an iron gun that didn't have any fancy stuff on it because he was using it for production, for hunting and he didn't need uh, a fancy gun, but this one, he said he called it a capital rifle, uh, which means it was a whole lot better rifle than a lot of the things that were available at the time. The brass work uh, starts at the nose cap right here and has one, two ferrules, one, two, three ferrules, and the uh, last ferrule that takes it into the ramrod goes behind, disappears in the stock right here and runs underneath the barrel. <clears throat> and then you get to the lock, the trigger guard's brass, you got two triggers, a set trigger. You pull this back, front trigger clicks, all you have to do is barely touch that front one that shoots. Um, safety is right there, put back one more, it's ready to fire. Uh, the old patch box is amazing how well it works. Um, if you push the right button here, it just flaps open like that. And that's where you'd put the cloth patches that would wrap around the round ball that would be uh, fired out of the barrel then. Um, the experts I've talked with think this rifle is a Pennsylvania gun. Uh, there, there were uh, some made in Northern Virginia that looked like this also, um, but they think it's a Pennsylvania gun. It may have been signed at one point and cut off back here. They signed it right on the top flat of the barrel, right at the lock. But what happened after a lot of firing, they, need, they would have to cut the rifle off and put it back so that they could get the hole resized to the right size. And a lot of times that took the maker's initials off. So that, that could have been the reason they were, they're not there. And that would also indicate the barrel would have been about two or three inches longer when Crockett had it than it is right now. <clears throat> 